all respect to Dr. Robert Lustig. Would love to have him on the podcast, have extended the invitation previously. He's not been interested in doing it. Maybe he will after this podcast. And this is not meant to be any sort of personal affront, just a discussion of ideas. Yeah. So this clip, this clip is about fructose and addiction and how it stimulates the addictive centers in the brain, right? So we're going to listen yeah. to Dr. Lustig tell us about fructose and, and its addictive qualities. Yeah. This is fructose <laughs> as addictive. Items in the American grocery store have added sugar on purpose for the food industry's purposes, not for yours, because fructose is addictive, activates the nucleus accumbens, the reward center of the brain, in the same way that ho cocaine, heroin, nicotine, alcohol do, and drives dopamine receptors down, just like nicotine, you know, alcohol, you know, cocaine, heroin do. That molecule, fructose, is number one, uh, completely vestigial to all vertebrate life. There is no biochemical reaction in any vertebrate that requires dietary fructose. So there's quite a few things to discuss here. Um, I, first thing I would say is just because something activates this nucleus accumbens portion of the brain doesn't inherently mean that it's an evil or negative thing. Now, Certain things that aren't that great, like morphine and cocaine, will activate this area and, and stimulate a reward process, but that doesn't necessarily characterize why they're so negative in other areas. If, as an example, if you, if you had a substance that had a benefit to you and it stimulated the reward process and there wasn't a negative, then it wouldn't necessarily be a problem. So this is where it's a kind of a false dichotomy to say just because this activates this addictive area of the brain means it's a negative thing. So I, I want to preface with that to start. And the reason why I want to do that is because both glucose and fats stimulate this area of the brain as well. And this is where the idea of context becomes important because like, why are these things, why are these fuel sources for the body stimulating signals of reward or uh, desire to continue to eat these, the, they call it like hedonistic and the research hedonistic, uh, desires for food or whatnot. And the reason why is basically the, the system needs energy to function at its core, right? Without any, without energy, no process in the body will function appropriately. You need ATP at, at its base. And the major ATP sources are going to be glucose, fructose, or fatty acids. And ideally fructose will be converted into glucose at the liver. So you're basically having a, a, a seeking or a, a drive towards finding these fuel sources. So that's the first thing. And I, there's some quotes here. I don't know if you want to read them, but essentially what the, the quotes discuss is glucose stimulates nucleus accumbens, uh, dopaminergic pathways as well, triggering the hedonic, the hedonic eating and binging. Fats stimulate dopaminergic pathways in the nucleus accumbens and also triggers hyperphagia and binging. Now, the... The other piece that I want to talk about here is the models with which they set this up are in rodents. And they use a model called the intermittent access model. And what they do is they cycle the rats between 12 hours of feeding deprivation or food deprivation and 12 hours of ad libitum eating. Now, this is a huge problem for an animal like a rat because the rats have... Um, they there's a quote here talking about their physiology, but they need to eat on a pretty consistent basis. Um, they if they don't eat on a regular basis, they drastically increase gluconeogenesis, which is the endogenous or their own body's production of glucose. And they they will burn through their food sources quite quickly. So one of the quotes they discuss is to meet the energy demands. Laboratory mice must eat and drink frequently with the average interval between food and drinking bouts being 34 and 42 minutes, respectively, a total of 36 food and 32 water bouts in 24 hours. So the rats need to eat consist relatively consistently, relatively frequently. And in this model, the way it's set up is in order to induce binging behavior by itself. So because you don't allow the rats access to food for 12 hours, and then what they do is they make them miss their first meal, when they get their food at this point, and then you also give them these food sources, they will inherently binge because they are hungry. <laughs> uh, 
So you're setting up a model to create a binging behavior. And then the other thing is you're using an animal model that requires uh, adi- like consistent feeding, feeding on a regular basis because of their me- metabolic rate and their unique metabolic circumstances. And then you're also seeing that these different food substrates, glucose and fats, are also causing this elevation in dopaminergic singling in the nucleus accumbens. So it's to say that fructose, uh, to imply that fructose is bad, just because it induces dopaminergic singling in the nucleus accumbens is a little bit tenuous with these other pictures presented next to it. I found a study also that I hope the audience will appreciate, which is that uh, it, it shows that it actually, that steak can do the same thing. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> steak activates the nucleus accumbens. So um, right and neural connectivity of the right and left nucleus accumbens after eating high and low quality steak. So I thought this was awesome. It's just an abstract, um, but they found that, uh, no surprise, high quality steak activated the nucleus accumbens more than low quality steak. So I, I think it's interesting that, that Dr. Lustig says fructose is vestigial, which is a word that means it has kind of a whole, an evolutionary holdover. People say the appendix is vestigial, but we know the appendix probably is a repository for uh, cultures of bacteria. So the appendix may not actually be vestigial, but vestigial essentially means it's an evolutionary holdover that has no value anymore for an organism. So he's just saying fructose is in our diets now as an evolutionary um, sort of fossil. Uh, our primate ancestors ate fructose from fruit, and, and now it has no role for humans. Well, I think that the idea that fructose activates an area of the brain linked with reward and seeking of certain behaviors suggests that fructose is not really vestigial for humans. I mean, it's like you said, this is an energy source, it's in a food that our ancestors undoubtedly consumed, it's in a food that all hunter-gatherer tribes ever studied on the planet consume. It's in a series of foods, whether it's fruit or honey, um, preferentially consume. And and so that to me is not super vestigial. And I just think it's interesting that he would say it activates the nucleus accumbens and say, oh, it's cocaine, it's dopamine. When basically most foods that you want do that. And I believe sex does that. So um, yeah, like, these are the behaviors that make us go round as humans. They, they activate this reward seeking thing in humans. Um, I was a little bit surprised Andrew didn't uh, ask more questions there. So yep. maybe we'll go to the next clip here, which is about fruit because, um, Andrew Huberman comes back and says, well, I eat fruit. Is fruit okay? And, and Robert Lustig says fruit is okay because the fiber prevents the absorption of fructose. So he's sort of saying there's a, there's a way out here. I eat berries galore, yeah. especially since the price of berries seems to have come down. Mm-hmm. It used to be that you only get them certain times a year. Mm-hmm. I'm what you call a drive-by blueberry eater. So okay. I'll just walk past and just take a fistful. You can't put them in front of me without me eating them. This is even difficult for me when other people I don't know are eating them. So right. um, I eat lots of blueberries, mm-hmm. strawberries, blackberries if they're in season. Mm-hmm. I love them. No problem. Loaded with fructose? No. Plenty of fiber. Low fructose? Low fructose. Okay. In berries? Berries are the Thank lowest goodness. fructose uh, oh, yes. of all I the I'm so worried fruits. about asking you this today. Not Thank a you. Okay. Um, and fruit is okay because of the fiber. So the molecule, the fructose molecule is the same, whether it's in a berry or in a banana or, for that matter, in a Coca-Cola. The fructose molecule is the same molecule. The difference is that in the berry, it comes with a whole lot of fiber. In the banana, it comes with a whole lot less fiber. And in the Coca-Cola, it doesn't come with any fiber. And the fiber is what mitigates the absorption. So when you consume the fructose with fiber, so your blueberries, you're feeding your microbiome. That fructose wasn't for you. All right, Mike. Uh, fiber makes it all okay. Oh, boy. Well, I think the first thing that we should talk about is if Andrew Huberman is a drive-by blueberry eater, so say he's going to smash eight ounces of blueberries in one sitting, and I'll give him about 20 grams of carbs and roughly 10 grams of fructose, which would actually be considered a high amount of fructose by Lustig's standards alone, 
I think the 12 gram amount is something that has been discussed previously. But there's a couple things to talk about. And let's get in specifically to the fiber piece. So fiber doesn't really inhibit absorption of fructose or glucose or many different dietary components. There's, um, there's a study here that I have looking and comparing uh, fresh orange consumption and a uh, match carbohydrate intake between orange juice. And what they essentially show here is the blood glucose levels after consuming the raw oranges versus consuming the orange juice is roughly the same. So the raw oranges, again, match for carbohydrates. The peak glucose value, blood glucose value was 98 milligrams per deciliter. And then the fresh orange juice was 104 milligrams per deciliter. So you're not essentially, you're absorbing the carbohydrates from both of them. So it's not going to be a massive difference in terms of, uh, in, t- in terms of what's going on, especially when you start to look at the insulin difference. So the raw oranges actually stimulated a higher insulin value than the fresh orange juice, interestingly. And so when you see the higher insulin value and the slightly lower carbohydrate intake, you, I assumed that at least with that perspective, that the absorption of the carbohydrate was actually on par. So that, the, that gets rid of the idea that the fiber itself is having an effect on the absorption of the carbohydrate because you're seeing the same rise in blood glucose between both groups. It'd be relatively equivalent. So that, that's the first piece. And that's just, to, that's just to specifically talk about, well, if you had fruit juice versus fruit, is the fiber making a difference? No, uh, at least not in terms of absorption. Now, the next thing that, they, that you can talk about Soluble dietary fibers do indeed delay nutrient absorption. However, the intestine adjusts for the delayed nutrient absorption and will actually uh, slow, well, uh, the inhibited nutrient absorption and it will slow down the transit through the small intestinal tract or through the small intestine in a process called an ileal break. And that will increase the absorption of the components inside the intestine. So the intestine, you will absorb the carbohydrates because the intestine is compensating for altered absorption from the soluble dietary fiber. And the soluble dietary fiber is delaying the absorption by adjusting the viscosity, like the, how thick the food is when it's moving through the intestine. So it makes it a little bit harder to access, but the intestine's like, all right, we know this fiber is making it a little bit harder to access. We're going to spend a little bit more time processing the food so that we can get all of the nutrient. So basically in the research, you're not seeing significant delays in absorption of carbohydrates from fiber. And then when you look and compare fruit juice versus whole fruits, you're also not seeing a massive change in what's going on with the blood glucose level, especially like this was whole oranges versus orange juice. 